so last last time I was saying that I was going to talk about flowers and I I said specifically that I would talk about tulips and when I started to write the script for today's Elevenses I was writing 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 and I realized that actually I'd written quite a lot before I'd even got to the tulip bit so this is going to be a two-parter um, we'll do tulips next Thursday but today this is kind of about flowers in art in general uh, so I want to start with this image um, you're gonna like this there we go looks very pretty doesn't it I'm gonna start with this one um, so this is an artist it's a pre-raphaelite artist by a pre-raphaelite artist called Sir Lawrence Alma Tadema and it dates to 1888 and what this is depicting is the story of an emperor and you can see uh, the emperor kind of almost in, in the middle of the work lying he looks like he's sort of lying on a on a table looking out to us at the, the back of the work uh, and this is Emperor Heliogabalus I can't even tell you how many times I've practiced that word and I still hesitated. Heliogabalus. This is Emperor Heliogabalus and he is was um, a pretty nasty guy I think it's safe to say debauched and probably psychotic. Nonetheless he and his entourage have managed to lure a few people to their home and, uh, and then they have proceeded to smother them and suffocate them with flowers. That's what this painting is about. So he's secreted a load of flowers in a full ceiling and then released them at an opportune moment for these people to be suffocated. Uh, I'm not entirely sure of the practicalities of that, whether it would in fact work. Um, if it would, I mean, you'd have to have a lot of flowers, wouldn't you? Um, worthy of killing Eve though if that was if that was a way to to kill somebody or many people at the same time I think the writers of Killing Eve should take note. Um, in the original story these flowers weren't the pink rose petals that you can see here. In the original story they were violets because violets in ancient Rome were funeral flowers. Um, here we've got these very very pretty pink roses that stand for death and corruption. Who knew? Well the answer to that is very few people would have known. Uh, this this is a, it's, it's a bit of a, a peculiar um, work in terms of the fact that there was probably only a very small percentage of the population for only a very short amount of time that would have really got this uh, sort of immediately um, and that's because so it was painted as I said in 1888 in the Victorian era etiquette especially amongst the upper classes was such that um, communication was stilted in in many ways stilted is that the right word anyway communication was difficult um and so especially between lovers people had to find ways of communicating that weren't necessarily through words and so the language of flowers became quite a big thing and different flowers meant different things and this was all the rage and so little dictionaries little reference books were written all about flowers and their meanings and so this rose had um, this meaning of death and corruption very very specific uh, and as I say that's probably almost entirely lost to us now but would have meant something to that uh, that particular tranche of a uh, Victorian society. Um, and by the way because the type of rose was so important in this instance Alma Tadema who was a bit of an obsessive anyway by all accounts he had shipments of these particular rose petals sent to him over the winter of 1887 and uh, to 1888 so that he could he could meticulously draw them from from life so important in this work um so that is an unusual example I grant you and when I was looking at this by the way it reminded me of do you remember American Beauty 
from um, the late uh, late 90s. I think it was 1999, I looked it up. And and I thought of it because, do you remember the the trailer and the poster for it with the, the, the girl um, in red rose petals? Well, during my research for this, I was looking at American Beauty and just reminding myself. And the whole film, if you, if you fancy going back and, and watching it again, it was a great film, as I remember. But the whole film really used the red rose as a, an image and as a symbol all the way through. Red roses, if you were watching The Ugly Duchess on Monday, we know that they are all to do with sex and sexuality and desire and passion and, and so on. So, um, so there you go. Yes, American Beauty. That was slightly an aside, but that made me excited when I discovered that. Um, so not all flowers are obscure in art or have meanings that are now perhaps a little bit lost to us. Some of them have endured um, one flower that has had the same meaning for centuries is the white lily. So the lilies you can see in the centre here, um, I think I have a close up, let's find it, there we go. Um, there you go, that's in the, the centre of this work. Uh, and the white lily has long been associated with the virgin. So white, the purity, um, the anthers in the, in the centre of the lily, this beautiful golden colour, so God's heavenly grace evoked there. Um, and uh, so really, really commonly, the lily would be used in works of the Annunciation, like this one. So this is by Simona Martini, a Sienese artist. This dates to 1333. Um, and it's, it's gorgeous. This is in the Uffizi in, in Florence. But I just love the way <laughs> that Mary is like, she's like, what? What on earth is going on? I only said a swear word there. Um, but do you know what I mean? That kind of that reaction that would be quite normal. I mean, I don't think it would be normal that she would sit there and go, oh, yes, OK, Gabriel, I've been waiting for you. Um, so I, I love this for its human approach. Uh, again, lilies appear in this work. So this is 1490s. This is by Carlo Crivelli. This is in the National Gallery. Um, before we do a close up of the lilies, can you spot the saints? So the one to the left-hand side in the grey is somebody that we haven't spoken about. This is St Francis. Uh, but the one on the right-hand side, I bet you've all got it. Um, this is obviously St Sebastian, shot through with arrows. But then the lilies, here are the lilies once again. So associated with the Virgin. There are carnations in the bottom there as well. Also flowers associated with the Virgin. Um, they were supposed to have grown uh, in the places that the Virgin's tears fell as she followed Christ's um, passage up um, up to the top of the hill with his with his cross. So it's so ubiquitous is the lily with the Virgin that sometimes, even in works that don't depict the Virgin herself, she is evoked. Uh, this is a work by a Spanish artist called Juan Zurbaran. His father was very famous. His father was called Francisco, Francisco Zurbaran. Juan um, didn't, he died quite young actually, so he didn't, didn't paint, uh, there aren't too many works by, by him around. This is also in the National Gallery, dates to the mid 17th century. Uh, but here, so you would think, oh, okay, this is just a lovely basket of flowers and lemons. And what would you think? Well, I would think, oh, lemons, gin and tonic. Thank you very much. Um, but in fact, this is steeped in religious imagery. Um, 17th century Spain, Catholic, religious fervour. So here, just take a look to the left hand side of the painting where you have uh, a beautiful sort of teacup um, with a lily out of one side and a little bird on the other side and the little bird is a goldfinch. Um, goldfinch also associated with the Virgin and with religion. So the goldfinch was a bird that was supposed to have taken a, a thorn from the, the, the crown of thorns, Christ's crown of thorns, and a goldfinch has a little red, uh, red area around its beak. 
And so this is a symbol of Christ's sacrifice. Um, if you see a goldfinch, if you're not feeling very well and you see a goldfinch in your garden or anywhere else, then look it in the eye. The goldfinch was evoked as a protection against the plague because if you look a goldfinch in the eye, then supposedly it will take on your, um, your disease. And, and free you from disease and take it on itself. Very kind little bird. Um, but of course, the other side of this uh, lovely little teacup, which is filled with, with water, is a lily. So this isn't even a white lily. The lily isn't even in a vase. But still, here, we, we very much get the association with the, the Virgin. Such is the, the power of the, the iconography. So... Flowers can definitely, flowers can definitely have symbolism within, within works in, in these various ways. They also very often feature in still life works. Um, so for example, here is example of a still life. And now the still life was particularly popular in the Netherlands um, in the 17th century. This is called the Dutch Golden Age. And in fact, paintings of all kinds um, were, were popular in the Netherlands in a way that was really new in Europe at the time. Um, the Netherlands in the 16th, sorry, 17th century was hugely, hugely wealthy, which is bonkers. They'd just been at war for about 100 years with Spain, um, but very industrious nation, built up this huge wealth. And the wealth was distributed as well amongst the middle classes. <laughs> my, my doorbell's ringing. I'm not going to answer it. I don't think it's for me. Um, and um, so wealth was distributed amongst the middle classes. And so people needed to find something to do with their money. Um, and so what did they do? They bought things. And some of the things that they bought were paintings. Um, and so that's why if you go into a gallery, by the way, if you go into an art gallery, if you go into the, a room of Dutch paintings from about the 17th century, most of the images are a lot smaller than many of the earlier images or, or, or images from um, paintings from anywhere else in Europe and that's because they were for private houses. So, so um, yeah, so people in, in the Netherlands wanted to purchase works of art, so they wanted them to look lovely. What they couldn't purchase were religious images because uh, that had been outlawed. So Protestant, um, mostly a Protestant country, um, after the Reformation, Protestants weren't supposed to look at religious imagery. But that wasn't to say that they weren't religious. And so what they did was they worked kind of themes of religion or theme, themes that were sort of had a sort of a moral value within into their artworks so a painting of flowers was a perfect example or a perfect thing flowers luxury goods so flowers were very expensive to buy a painting obviously was very expensive so it's showing off wealth but flowers, of course, don't last very long. And so therefore, especially when they're cut, and in this work, so this is a work by Ambrosius Boschart, what a fantastic name, from about 1614, I think. Uh, so here he is very kindly included some images of cut flowers um, outside of this lovely basket. Uh, so flowers don't last very long and so therefore the message behind this work is that yes okay you can have all this luxury you can have all of these these beautiful things but they're all transient and also they remind us of course of the transience of life so essentially still lives in well in most eras in most places but definitely in the the Netherlands in the 17th century were memento mori so re reminders that we're all going to die um look at the insects in this aren't they great so the insects quite often can also feed into this it's 
use the expression, uh, feed into this idea of memento mori. But here, I think they are more about industriousness. Uh, look, you know, they're all quite busy going about their going about their little insect work. Um, so I, I think that that's a, a sort of um, a, a parallel to the industriousness of the of the Dutch nation. So yeah, so flowers as symbols, flowers as memento mori in, in still lifes. So how about this work, which we will be coming on to next Thursday. This is by Rachel Roish, very, very famous flower painter, beautiful big tulip at the top here. Uh, so this is what we're going to be talking about next week. Rachel Roish was more famous and her works sold for more money than Rembrandt in the Netherlands in the 17th and early 18th centuries. So I'm going to turn commenting back on. I hope you're feeling beautifully, suitably floral. Oh, I've just left that image. Right, let me just turn that off and put myself, put myself back. There we go. Um, yeah. So next time you go into a gallery and you see pretty pictures of flowers in vases, you'll know that quite likely they have got different meanings. Oh, you've, oh, that's good. I'm glad you feel inspired. Do you feel inspired to go and look at Dutch art or do you feel inspired to go and paint some flowers? Maybe just paint some flowers. I'm not very good at painting. Oh, tulips next. Oh, thank you. And you know what I was thinking that we could do yeah, I'm going to be looking at goldfinches in the eyes all day. I hope you're not ill. <laughs> um, but I also thought that maybe on Monday we could do something from um, uh, uh, something else from Dutch art because Dutch art is really fascinating in that it looks very lifelike. So you think that it's just a snapshot from daily life. Um, but in fact, nearly all Dutch art, certainly from the 17th century, has... Um, has an inner meaning and you know deeper meaning it's full of symbolism full of full of crazy things so it's quite it's quite fun to look at so I think that's what we're going to do on Monday oh Mary go paint so Victoria Pebble the dog you're going to go and pick and, and Mary you're going to go and paint nice Poppy saw a goldfinch there you go so Poppy's going to be fine hopefully <laughs> staring goldfinches in the eyes. Well, have a lovely rest of the day, everybody, and a lovely, what day are we today? Thursday, and have a lovely weekend. Um, get out there. We, we are allowed our one walk, aren't we? So go and enjoy the beautiful flowers that are around at the moment. Um, but for now, I will head off and I will see you on Monday with some Dutch art. And then on Thursday, we'll talk about... Uh, tulips. Is it St George's Day? Oh, happy St George's Day. I should have done St George. Never mind. Flowers instead. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Have a good day. <laughs>